and welcome. I'm Rabbi Julia Andelman, Director of Community Engagement at JTS, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the first session of our new, I was going to say spring series. It doesn't feel like spring yet, but the spring semester series. Um, the series, as you know, it's called The Power of Emotion, Judaism, and the Inner Life. Um, we have tried throughout the, the pandemic, which is when uh, our Monday web webinar started, to choose topics that um, that fit the moment and that felt like um, what what we all, the staff and um, and our the lay leaders who we work with, um, thought were issues where we could use uh, a good dose of Jewish wisdom to um, to guide us and related to issues that that were on our minds and in our hearts. And we started with. Um, times of crisis and opportunity, which is kind of the headspace we were all in at the very beginning. Um, we moved on to living a life of meaning since so many of us were working in our own homes um, or, or, or living in an isolated way and kind of looking inward about um, what, what, what's most important to us right now. Um, so we've tried to do that throughout. And here we are uh, to talk about emotion. I know that I personally, I think a lot of people um, who I've been in touch with are feeling this, um, this Omicron wave pretty hard. We sort of thought we were headed in a, we thought we were seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and after a couple of years of feeling pretty depleted, um, this dragged us down a little bit more. Um, so I know a lot of us are in a, a space of, um, feeling somewhat emotionally low, feeling uh, back to um, maybe feeling isolated the, were, the way we were before and had, and had thought we didn't need to be anymore. Um, so that's one piece of, of uh, the way in which this series is relevant. Of course, throughout all of our lives and all moments, um, we're experiencing emotion, experiencing emotion and it, it drives us and it impacts our decisions. We read texts and experiences through the lens of emotion. So all of that is where this series, the concept for this series came from. And what do you know? Um, Jewish texts and Jewish wisdom have so much to offer us. Um, all of our um, rabbinic and biblical and medieval uh, forebears um, also lived emotional lives and and brought that to what they did. So we have uh, we really have so much to learn from our texts um, on the feelings that kind of accompany us through our lives and our days, and that really determine a lot of how we experience life. So, um, so personally, I'm really excited about this topic, and I'm so excited to learn from our amazing JTS scholars uh, on on these issues. Um, I want to, of course, welcome anyone who hasn't been with us for those series. If you're joining us today for the first time, a special welcome to you. Um, we're really thrilled to have Professor David Kramer kicking us off again. Uh, Dr. Kramer has started uh, several of the series already, um, and Tani will, will introduce him uh, later, but he'll be speaking on the importance of shame in rabbinic tradition. Um, I want to thank today's sponsors. Marlene Castle is sponsoring today's session in memory of her mother, Frida Eisen Castle. Thank you so much, Marlene, uh, for sponsoring at the Chacham level. Um, and uh, for all of you, if you're feeling inspired by this learning with JTS's Outstanding Scholars, we would love for you to consider partnering with us by sponsoring a session. We have three sponsorship levels, um, Chacham for 540, Tzadik for 1,000, and Navi for 1,800, and you can learn more by emailing learninglives at jtsa.edu. And on that note, I will turn it over to Tani to do the rest of the opening announcements. Thank you, Rabbi Andelman. Um, also so pleased um, and excited to welcome you to uh, our, our first session in our new series. Um, and just to uh, review um, of the structure of the session, um, and, and how we'll do our Q&A, uh, Dr. Kramer will pause for questions periodically throughout the class and we'll also have Q&A period at the end. You can use the chat feature to submit your questions to Rabbi Julia Andelman. During the Q&A period, Rabbi Andelman will select a few of the questions to present to Dr. Kramer. For any technical or logistical questions, please initiate a private chat with either myself or with Lynn Simon. The sources for today's class were in the email that you received with the Zoom link for the session um, and will be screen shared as well. And we will also share a link shortly in the chat. 
Um, so pleased to introduce uh, Dr. David Kramer, who, um, as Rabbi Andelman mentioned, you know, has, has opened up the series several times, and we're, we're so excited to have him um, teach us today. Dr. Kramer is the Joseph J. and Dora Abel, Abel Librarian at the Jewish Theological Seminary, where he has also served as professor of Talmud and rabbinics for many years. As librarian, Professor Kramer oversees the most extensive collection of Judaica in the Western Hemisphere. Professor Kramer has written, written several books, um, and more information about his books is available on the bio that we included with the sources. So I'm so pleased to uh, turn it over to Dr. Kramer. There we go. We were working against one another. Um, <laughs> thank you, Tani, and thank you, Julia. It's so great to see a few of you on my screen um, and uh, to know that um, I'm getting a question here, Tani. Someone wants to control my camera. Should I approve that or decline that? You can decline that. I'm not quite sure okay. where that's coming from. OK. Um, so um, anyhow, I, I, you know, th th there are many of us here together, and I hope uh, that we can feel one another's presence if only in the ether of electronic connection. I, I, I do wish that we were able to be back together again. And Julia, I will say that um, I, I identify strongly with what you said at the beginning about our emotions, you know, becoming complicated and going up and down over the course of the pandemic. One of the ways I encourage myself in recent days is by logging on daily to the uh, New York City Health Department's COVID statistics site, uh, where you will find that our levels are down so quickly uh, and so, you know, enormously that uh, I don't know about you, but I'm beginning to feel like there is light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, so, you know, uh, I hope that's true. I hope there aren't other reversals, but at the moment, at least things are working here in the right direction. For those of you elsewhere, uh, the trends we see here promise to visit you soon as well. Um, emotions, the inner life, uh, really important topic, obviously. Uh, you may wonder why it is that I chose shame uh, as an emotion with which to begin. I've, I mean, it's a difficult uh, one to begin with. It's a difficult uh, emotion, if we, if we call it emotion as opposed to feeling. Uh, it's difficult to discuss altogether. I think it's fair to say that shame... Um, occupies a difficult position in our broad cultural way of thinking about things. Uh, none of us enjoys experiencing shame. We certainly don't want to be shamed. Uh, I'll work with different translations uh, and there'll be multiple vocabulary terms, both in the Hebrew and the English. I'm not sure whether the right word is shame or embarrassment. Different words will make more or less sense at different points in our discussion. Um, but shame is something that we all feel. Uh, it may be something that we learn. I emotions feel like they're natural. Uh, and to some degree, some emotions may be natural. Uh, I'm not an expert in this, so I'll allow others to debate that, but certainly you'll hear people who speak about shame as being something that's learned. I'm actually right now reading a book manuscript for a friend of mine uh, who will be publishing a book in the not-too-distant future uh, that's called Shanda. Uh, Shanda, I think, right, in Yiddish term, usually translated as shame. Uh, and the author, she, uh, does discuss ways that she learned that certain things were shameful uh, in her youth, and that leads to complicated emotions. Were they good to learn shame about? Was it shameful to experience this shame? And so forth. Uh, it's complicated. It's fair to say that. Um, I think that if there is one Jewish teaching about shame that most 
Jews know. I don't mean that most Jews actually know this. What I mean is if they know any Jewish teaching about shame, this is the one they are most likely to know. It is that if someone shames another in public, uh, it is as though you shed their blood. Uh, the Hebrew there is malbin pnei chaveiro berabim, literally whiten your fellow's face in public. Uh, it is considered to be a grievous uh, transgression to shame someone else publicly. And so from that teaching, if you know no other, you may conclude that shame is not a good thing, even though we all do experience it from time to time. Uh, the complication of this is that, in fact, what I just said is not true, that there are times that shame uh, is a bad thing, and there are, as you will see, times that shame is a good thing. And what I'd like our discussion to move toward as we go through sources is to ask the question, what is the value of shame and what is the bad quality of shame? And I think it's fair to say that they're both of those things. So um, we'll all have our own responses and you will have an opportunity in the midst of our studying together to reflect on that yourselves and to suggest your own opinions, to ask questions that you like. But I am going to approach it with really an eye toward making this discussion uh, as nuanced and complicated as possible. So um, for the negative, I just gave um, you know, a source if, some, if you shame your fellow in public. I don't know whether what I'm about to say is positive, but at least we feel that it's not quite as obviously negative. So we're all familiar with a phrase like, have you no shame, right? When we say such a thing, have you no shame? Right? What we mean is that someone is doing something that I condemn that they should have known not to do in the first place. They should have been ashamed at even contemplating it, right? Their shame is not a negative feeling, a negative emotion, even though it may be uncomfortable for the person who experiences it. The question though is, is there something positive potentially about the experience of that discomfort? Or when somebody says, I feel ashamed. Again, what they're reflecting on is that they've experienced discomfort, they've felt discomfort, but they've done something that they now realize they should not have done, right? So shame as a function, both for ill, but potentially also in phrases like the one I just indicated for good, uh, that's the other side of it. And it's both of those sides that we're gonna explore. So Tani, why don't we put up the source sheet and let's begin uh, at the very beginning. Shame is one of the first feelings uh, that the Torah describes. Um, so let's look at it together. If you've got the source sheet open, um, then you've got it. If not, is yeah, that's great. We've just, I was just about, can you expand it? But clearly we can. So here we are in the garden, right? After the general creation story of chapter one into the beginning of chapter two of Genesis, after the more focused creation story of the creation of the humans, uh, and uh, after their creation, they find themselves in the garden. And as you can see, Vishnehem Arumim, they were both naked, Hadam Vishto, Adam and his woman, Velo Yit Bosh Shashu. And they did not feel any shame, embarrassment, shyness, any of those terms would here work here for the moment. But we notice immediately the association between nakedness, which in the garden is not the cause of the experience of shame, but as the story progresses, and as we read it, living ourselves after the expulsion from the garden, we know that there is an association between nakedness and shame. Uh, and this will be key to the way we move forward. So let's see the way this story develops. Uh, famously, the most crafty, right, which in your translation you can see is more naked. The term in Hebrew is the same of all of the animals in the garden was the serpent who misled Chava, misled the woman um, with respect to the tree, um, with the fruit of the tree of the garden, which they, Adam and Eve, had been directed not to eat from. Uh, the 
um, with his cleverness, uh, with his craftiness, the serpent is able to seduce the woman into eating from the fruit of that tree. And crucially, uh, so how, whatever sense we make of the mythical story, and I will leave that uh, to you to interpret how you want to take the story as a whole, but the story, uh, whether myth or not, clearly gets to a very deep truth, um, goes on to say, this is in verse 5, because the Lord knows, or God knows, that when you eat from it, from the fruit of the tree, your eyes will be opened, and you shall be like gods or like God, depending upon whether we translate the plural Hebrew as singular or plural. Um, and what does that mean? Knowing good and evil. So look at the associations that we've uh, just seen that um, beforehand, they experienced no shame despite the fact that they were naked. But it is also clear because of the transition of verse five that their eyes were not yet open however we understand that, and that they were not like God, and to be like God means to know something about this distinction between good and evil. Uh, continue, I want to fill out this whole picture and then say some general words about it. Um, verse 6, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, um, I mean, that's fine as a translation, but first of all, again, notice the eyes open connection connected to seeing, but uh, the English doesn't capture the Hebrew. The Hebrew, uh, which is translated as pleasing to the eye, is ki ta'avahu le'enayim. Now, ta'ava um, means desire, uh, or it might even mean lust. Uh, it has those connotations in different settings, and there's no reason to erase them here. Something about opening the eyes, being able to see something that's attractive, awakens one's desire um, and desire or appetite. And the eating, you know, the consumption part of this also in many, many settings, as you know, has a sexual desire connotation. So opening the eyes leads to desire. Desire is connected to sexuality, to being able to see that one is naked, um, goes on. She gave some to her husband who was with her. He ate it. And verse seven, then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. And so they covered themselves. Um, for me, the most crucial question here is, which is a better description of what it means to be human? The man and woman in the garden or the man and woman expelled from the garden? In other words, is being human about the perfect state, and I here do want to question whether this counts as a perfect state at all, about the perfect state of being in the garden, where after all, there is no shame, but one's eyes are not yet open. One does not yet have a sense of the difference between good and bad. One does not yet experience desire. All of those things are not yet present in the pre-expulsion humans in the garden, and they are awakened precisely at the time we will be expelled in order to occupy common human history. Which is the more human, the human of the garden or the human after? Uh, I will welcome responses to this later when I take a pause for questions or comments, but I wanna argue um, that in fact, uh, to be human is to experience all of these things, to know that one is naked, to see and experience desire, to have some sense that certain things are good and certain things are not good. Uh, all of those together are associated with beforehand, I can't experience shame. And when I emerge, I know that I can be naked. I know that I can do bad. I also can experience shame. Uh, that, I think, is the foundation of this entire discussion. And, you know, it occurs to me, I'm about to go on to legal materials, and there'll be a very uh, quick change of tone. So, uh, Tani, I just want to provide a couple of minutes for people to respond in the chat or ask a question about what I just said. I'll provide more time later, but I think it's fair to provide a moment for quick response, either to the biblical text or to what I just said. 
Um, we've just done one question in so far, but uh, someone asked if now that I said that they're going to start flooding in. But um, someone asked if there's a distinction made in, um, or if you make a distinction between shame and embarrassment in in the sources or in how you're how you're presenting this test. Yeah, I don't. I, I mean, I'm consciously not seeking to categorize here. This will be a very anti-Aristotelian presentation, right? Where definitions are left loose and categories unclear. Because honestly, I we'll get to one source that tries to make the distinction. Maimonides tries to divide, and so whoever asked the question, I promise, if I don't answer, then Maimonides will at least try to. But uh, as I thought about this question, I, I found myself very unsatisfied with making the distinctions. I don't know um, when shame is the best translation, when embarrassment is, what the difference between those things are. Uh, when you look at the translations, it's interesting. The teaching that I mentioned before, you know, if somebody shames their fellow in public, sometimes you'll see the translation shame. Sometimes you'll see the translation embarrass. There's no legal difference between the two. Uh, and I don't see that the translation into one language or the other other captures anything. If the person who asked the question or others feels that there's a difference, then um, please, you know, adapt the translation as you see fit for context. But I, I don't see a clear difference. Okay, thanks. All right, so the comments that I'm getting in are really about um, favoring the, uh, the post garden. Um, yeah. Uh, state of things or, or thinking of that as kind of a more natural human um, place to be. So I'll share a couple of them with you um, that, you know, that, that humans were created outside of the garden and then God placed them there. So maybe, you know, they were never intended to, um, to be there to begin with. Uh, one I like person, that. Yeah. Um, one person shared pre-expulsion always represented childhood or even infancy to me with post-expulsion representing adulthood. I agree completely with that statement. Yeah, go ahead. Um, all right, we weren't truly human in the garden. One person writes, Eve's action was the first exercise of free will, which we as humans exercise. Yeah, yeah, I mean, listen, e Eve's was in some sense um, the first significant um, action that happened with human agency in human history, at least according to the biblical history. And the fact that it is an act of exercise of free will and disobedience is crucial. Um, it's a disobedience which stands as a model for all future disobedience. And let it not be thought that it's a bad thing because it is precisely the disobedience, this disobedience uh, that leads to um, that you, leads to humans being human. I would just add to that the fact that interestingly, when you look at the first many chapters of Genesis, it's actually not humans who have to learn anything. Humans are who they are. Um, the, the problem with uh, the first chapters of Genesis is, is that God doesn't understand the humans that God created. And so I think more than anything else, it's uh, the history of God figuring out who humans are uh, and finally figuring out a way to live with that. Uh, okay, shall I go on? Anything else? Go ahead. Well, that just, that's really interesting because the other thing I was going to share that, that a lot of people were sharing is, um, is the idea of shame, um, the idea of shame is something that that then that we learn from or that motivates us to learn and that maybe even right, like Eve was was seeking knowledge is one way of reading it so so you were um presenting alternative view and I'll just um I'll just flag one more question which maybe I don't know if you want to address now or not but kind of a general question about shame um which is the connection to guilt that's kind of a big question mm -hmm. um shame and guilt when we when yeah. we've done wrong yeah, you know, well, I'll start dealing with it, but then I, we will come back to it multiple times. Um, you know, I, I don't know, how does guilt figure in our, our culture these days? A lot of people think guilt isn't a good thing. Uh, I, I had a former student whose book I looked for on my shelves and couldn't find in preparation for uh, this session on guilt. 
Um, and the argument with kind of with the same sort of approach that I'm using here was that, you know, guilt has a very important place. Frankly, if someone can't experience guilt, we're in a lot of trouble or they're in a lot of trouble. If they have any power, then we're in a lot of trouble. And I will allow you to associate to whatever politician leader you want. Guilt uh, or shame has an important function in human relations. Um, and if, you know, I would submit that if you don't experience guilt, then you're probably failing in your relations amongst other things. I, I mean, the one line from all of movie history that I hate the most, although it was terribly romantic, um, was from Love Story. You know, I mean, love means never having to say you're sorry. Really? Like, what world do you live in? Uh, I mean, if you've been in a love relationship and never said you're sorry, you have failed utterly. Um, so uh, in any case, it, it, guilt has a place here and there is an association between shame and the experience of guilt. So let's bear that in mind as we move forward, okay? Yeah, and uh, sorry, I'll, I'll just add my own thought to what yes, you just please. Maybe, maybe um, what you made me think is it really in both cases, um, there, there are feelings of shame and guilt that are justified because we did something that brought those feelings on and cases where, um, where someone is putting that, putting that feeling on us or putting us in a situation of feeling that feeling. So, right. So those are, those are two quite different things. So maybe that's yes. one way of thinking of those. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And that difference is very important. I, I mean, the, the most, the last example that I read in this manuscript of this book that will be published, the title of which will be Shonda, um, was about um, girls being, you know, when they arrive at puberty to be taught to be ashamed of the onset um, of their um, menstrual flows, of their periods. Um, and, you know, the old traditional way of a, a girl having her first menstruation and being slapped. I mean, we're about to see this in a moment when we get to the rabbinic teaching, but being slapped for this um, as though it were something to be ashamed of. Uh, and yes, I, I mean, that can certainly create, I, I mean, you've already said it. Um, so we do need to bear in mind distinctions. There are places where shame will function well, or there are places where it potentially can be very destructive. And we can discuss that as we go forward as well. Okay, good. Um, so um, let's go forward. Uh, there are two kind of threads of discussion that I'd like to um, follow in rabbinic and post-rabbinic, later rabbinic discussions of shame. The first is uh, in the discussion in the early rabbinic texts, the Mishnah, um, 200 CE approximately, uh, where shame, that is one of several possible translations, but again, it's the same translation problem we've seen uh, already, um, where shame is considered to be an injury that one does to another. In the course of damaging another, injuring another, one possible consequence of an injury is shame. And so when the rabbis formulate a mission that discusses injuries and the obligations that one who causes the injury has to the one injured, one of the five categories that one is obligated to, that creates a legal obligation is shame. So uh, Tani, if you wanna go back to the source sharing uh, and so, so that everyone can see it, and we're at Baba Kama chapter eight, the next page, and if you can expand it, um, that would be helpful. Okay, perfect. Uh, Baba Kama chapter eight. Um, there is more Hebrew here than there is English because I left out the parts of this in between that explain how you figure out payment for other kinds of injury. And in the English, I focus, uh, and the yellow highlights this, um, you know, focus on the part that talks about shaming or embarrassing or humiliation. So, uh, oh, the other thing I should say before going on is that I have taken and slightly adjusted this translation from the translation that appears on Safaria, the online resource of classical Jewish texts with translation in English, where translation is available. Um, in what I'm about to read, the bolded text is 
the actual original Hebrew text and the unbolded text is the translators filling in the blank to make it a little bit clearer. So one who injures another is liable to pay compensation for that injury due to five types, right? There are five categories of injury. He must pay for damage, outright damage that is, pain for medical costs, for loss of livelihood, and for here the translation is humiliation, but you can see in the Hebrew, uva voshet or uva voshet, uh, voshet is the same root that we saw back there in Genesis. So, you know, there's no good reason to translate it differently. It has the same range of meaning. So, um, I skip. The Hebrew includes the way to figure out payment for the other things, at least in part. And then uh, it goes on in the highlighted part of the be at the bottom, how is payment for humiliation assessed? If it all depends on the one who humiliates or embarrasses and the one who is humiliated. Okay, so pay careful attention uh, because there's a lot here. And in typical rabbinic fashion, uh, the rabbis embody principles in specific illustrations or cases, but there are principles behind them that we have to expand upon. So one who humiliates a naked person or one who humiliates a blind person or one who humiliates a sleeping person is liable, but a sleeping person who humiliates another is exempt. If one fell from the roof onto another person and thereby caused him damage and humiliated him, then the one who fell is liable for the damage and exempt from the humiliation, meaning paying for the humiliation, as it is stated, uh, and putting out her hand, she takes hold of his private parts. Uh, a law from Deuteronomy talking about something quite different, but applied here. And the, what they take it to mean is that a person is not liable for humiliation unless he intends to humiliate the other person. So since the Mishnah itself says this explicitly, uh, I, I'll just repeat it. Obviously, one key to what's going on here uh, is that uh, in order to be liable for the embarrassment or humiliation, humiliation that one causes, an injury, um, then, you know, one needs to intend it. Unintentional embarrassment does not create obligation. Um, you might say you're sorry, but there's no, you know, financial recompense as there is uh, in other cases of humiliation. But there's a lot more here than that. So let's go back and look specifically uh, at what it seems to mean. It all depends on the one who humiliates and the one who is humiliated. So let's first, you know, take that as a general statement. What does that mean? Right? It's not a clear definition, right? With that much information, it might be difficult to figure out how much damage is a court should assign to someone who's caused the humiliation of another. But what does it say? What does it tell us about the rabbi's understanding of embarrassment or shame or humiliation? Now, I'm not going to open up the discussion because I know the difficulties of that with this number of people, but just think about it for a moment. Now, I'm going to make a suggestion, but Tani or Julia, um, after my suggestion, if, some, if people want to add other suggestions uh, in the chat, they're welcome to. So, you know, at one level, this is at least about the recognition that different people, for certain reasons, will experience certain acts in different ways, right? It may have to do with their station in society. And may have to do with the station of the one who humiliates or embarrasses them. It may have something to do with the society itself. There are certain things that are considered within a given society to be humiliating or embarrassing. As we go on, there are other interesting things here. Uh, uh, Interesting, again, that the first example, one who humiliates a naked person, we might have thought, going back to Genesis, uh, that if you're already naked, 
then does that mean you can't experience humiliation? Does it mean you're already humiliated enough or should be embarrassed or shamed enough that nothing's going to add to that? Clearly, they don't believe that to be the case, even if you are in what others would consider would consider an embarrassing circumstance, you can experience more. When humiliates a blind person tells us something about their cultural bias, when who humiliates a sleeping person is liable is very, very interesting because what this suggests is that if someone is embarrassed, I'm sorry, excuse me, if someone causes the embarrassment of someone else, while they are sleeping, of course, if it occurs while you are sleeping, you cannot actually experience it. You are, after all, sleeping, right? And so when you wake up, the question now becomes, the act occurred before, but I only learned about it after I woke up. Can I still consider that injury? And according to this text, the answer is yes, even if you don't experience it at the moment. Nevertheless, uh, it's something that counts as injury and should be uh, compensated. Or, um, well, we had blind uh, person, what am I skipping here, a sleeping person, um, but a sleeping person who humiliates another or someone who falls from roof, there there is no liability because all of this requires intention in order for liability to occur. Um, so those are my first quick thoughts on this. Um, differential in person and who they are, the way they experience it, their place in society, uh, the cultural conditionedness of this is part of it. I don't know if we would want to add beyond that as well, but I open up for your comments or questions for a few minutes to expand our way of thinking about this. So um, while I wait for comments on that particular um, question, of course, I've now gotten 200 comments on the previous question. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, well, um, I was about to say, well, you could only get 400 total since that's the number, <laughs> but of course we haven't limited anybody to a single comment. So go ahead. <laughs> um, no, I'll just share. I used to teach this text to 11 year olds and, um, and I would, I would give them the example of, um, you know, something that they might do to appear um, would be different if they did that to, the head of school or you know if we were in camp to the camp director um so that's you know i i um right that's sort of about station which maybe is what this is this is getting at but i think um i guess the way i read it more now is the, the larger issue really is is kind or one larger issue is context right mm -hmm. that, that the, the camp director or the head of school you know is also some you know someone's you know grandmother or dad or whatever and like the same thing at home um may not <clears throat> may not embarrass them in the same way right so we're, we're vulnerable to humiliation very differently depending on on the context yeah no i think that's very fair um and i, I mean the mission that will go on further to give other examples to explain itself so we're not left merely to speculate here um, but I, it, my read of this Mishnah is that it is essentially all of the above, um, that by adding interpretations, we only add to the nuance of the Mishnah itself, um, which expresses itself in very, very broad terms. It all depends upon the one who humiliates and the one who is humiliated. You could hardly get more general than that. They recognize that it is conditional and subjective. Okay, right. others. So, so yeah, an interesting point that was just raised related to what you're saying is, um, I'll read verbatim the way the person wrote it. There are people who humiliate others and are so insensitive, they don't realize they're doing that. They blame the person who's been humiliated for being overly sensitive. Um, are they without blame as they didn't intend to cause shame? And there were some other comments about intention here. Um, but that, so I guess you could see that as, a, as sort of a danger point in this, in this text, right? That there's context and there's station. But there's also um, how different people experiencing experience things, and could that be made sort of an excuse or a way of lessening the shame that someone has caused to someone else? Uh, potentially, it can. And I, I, I might add, it, it's impossible to have this th conversation today without being aware, without and labeling. Um, the difficult position we are in, in at least American society today, with respect to precisely this question, because, um, I, I mean, you can translate that this into many contexts, but there are people who, um, you know, take issue quickly, who feel 
shamed or embarrassed or hurt or, you know, whatever it might be. And those who have spoken in a way that they believe to be innocent, uh, even if others listening or observing them might not think it so innocent, say, this is the fault. This is an extension of what you were saying. This is the fault of the person who's being too sensitive. I think there's a reason um, that the illustrations of unintentional shame here are what they are. This is not just about someone saying, oh, I didn't mean it. I really, you know, what I meant was X or I didn't intend to embarrass you. Or, I'm sorry if I embarrassed or insulted you, you know, or if, I'm sorry if I made you feel that kind of, as opposed to, wow, I see how you really might have experienced this because what I said was insensitive. That's the problem that we experience again and again. Um, but look at the examples. Someone who embarrasses somehow, right? Some of us walk in our sleep. Some of us flail about in our sleep. We can cause injury, but it's talking about literally someone who's unconscious, unconscious or someone who's fallen off a roof, right? These are, as it were, cases of extreme lack of intention where it's impossible to construe it as intention unlike other cases, including what you began to raise, uh, Julia, which was that, you know, we may think that we didn't intend it, but to what degree are we responsible for being actually responsible for the cultural sensitivity that our given historical and cultural moment calls for, right? At some point, Maybe you can excuse it as I didn't intend it. And at other points, again, because this is all about the historical cultural context, right? There is also a responsibility at some level to know these things and to take responsibility for one's, for the injuries one causes. Let's go ahead. I'm sure there are other comments, but let's fill it in with the other examples from the same Mishnah. Very often when this is taught, people will teach this part of the Mishnah without going on to the specific examples. So let's look at the way the Mishnah itself expands upon this. Um, so this is um, the same chapter of the Mishnah, which is Baba Kama uh, chapter eight, but this is Mishnah number six of that same chapter. And I'm just gonna read through it with a little bit of elaboration and then some comment. One who strikes another must give him a cella. So there's a discussion of how much is the embarrassment, the injury that is caused worth. Um, Rabbi Yehuda says in the name of Yossi Aglili that he must give him 100 dinars, right? So very different evaluation. Um, the second giving a much higher amount of you know, what this is, um, worth. If he slapped another on the cheek, he must give him 200 dinars. So there's something about one's face and slapping someone on that face, which as it were ups the ante, it makes the injury done, the shame or embarrassment more grievous. Um, if he slapped him on the cheek with his back, the back of his hand, he must give him 400 dinars. Now, on some level, this is about the meaning of an act in a given cultural context, right? There's some places where whether you slap with the front of the hand, with the palm or with the back of the hand, it might not make a difference. But in this society, clearly, while slapping someone's face with the palm of one's hand is a terrible thing, slapping them with the back of the hand is even worse if he pulled his ear or pulled out his hair, or spat at him and his spittle reached him, or if he removed the other's cloak from him, uncovering him, right? Or if he uncovered the head of a woman in a marketplace, given their cultural requirements, he must give the injured party 400 dinars. This is, in this context, the high level of payment that's required. Now, this is the principle. It is all evaluated in accordance with the honor of the one who was humiliated, okay? Which harkens back to what we saw before. But then we see an interesting move here. And this text is also taught frequently for this part of it, um, which is quite striking, even startling. Rabbi Akiva said, even with regard to the poor amongst the Jewish people, so those who do not begin at so high a level of honor in the society, um, they are viewed as though they were, we have to go to the next page, 
free men, right? So the poor are not the poor. They are free men who lost their property and then were impoverished. In other words, you preserve what is at least imagined to be by definition as their earlier station, right? And their humiliation, the payment for that injury is calculated according to that status. Why, Akiba continues, as they are the children, right? All of Israel are the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and therefore we all have at some fundamental, foundational level the same honor due us because we are all of noble stock, as it were. And now a story. And an incident occurred involving one who uncovered the head of a woman in the marketplace. And the woman came before Rabbi Akiva to request, you know, payment. She had been injured. Um, and Rabbi Akiva, you know, made the assailant liable to give her 400 dinars because that was the amount given, indicated before. The man says to Rabbi Akiva, my teacher, give me time to pay the penalty. And Akiva said, okay, you've got some time. So what does the guy do? The man then goes and waits for this same woman who he is obligated to now, according to Rabbi Akiva's judgment, until she was standing by the opening of her courtyard and he broke a jug in front of her, and as you'll see, holding olive oil. Um, and there was the value of about an isar, a small amount of oil inside the jug. So the woman does what? She takes the covering of her head, she exposes her head, um, and she sops up the oil um, with you know, the, her head cover uh, and placing her hand on her head to make use of the oil. So for her, it's you know, not worth wasting the oil. She exposes herself. Uh, the man who set up this little trap um, set up witnesses to observe her actions. And he came before Rabbi Akiva and he said to him, will I give 400 dinars to this woman? who is willing to expose her head in public for the smallest amount of oil. And Rabbi Akiba responds and says, you didn't say anything, right? That is to say, you're not off the hook. One who injures himself, although it is not permitted for him to do so, in this case, the woman who exposed her head, is nevertheless exempt, but others who injured him are liable to pay. Um, there are a number of ways we could translate this story, but one way uh, to speak of it would be to say that if she wants to, you know, embarrass or shame herself, given the cultural judgment of her historical um, cultural place, that is up to her to do. But that doesn't release someone who injures her or anybody else in a similar and equivalent situation from the obligation that emerges from an act that embarrasses or shames another. Um, so I think two things uh, stand out in this uh, text, or at least for me, though others may for you. The first is um, what I just said, that um, someone's compromising their own position, uh, doesn't compromise the honor that we owe them. Uh, the second would be that all of Israel, uh, at least, are, you know, are nobility at, at some level. Uh, and therefore, it's just not right to radically distinguish between one person or another, even though there is a subjectivity here, the subjectivity is not absolute. Everyone has a fundamental dignity, uh, is what this text says, and that fundamental dignity entitles them to payment if someone else injures them by creating embarrassment, shame, or the like. Um, there's a lot more to be said here, so let me pause and invite any kind of comment or question on this text as it expands upon the earlier, more general teaching from this mission in Baba Kama here, or anything else that we have seen so far. Um, so I'm sorting through so many questions, and I think it, you know, maybe it's just worth naming something that we all know, but um, but doing so anyway that. Um, that we all carry shames from different points in our lives, um, you know, including our our childhood that 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 can impact us for you know lifelong. So I'm, um, you know, the um, 
every once in a while there's a session where the where the the number of comments is like more than a person can handle and you know this is one of them and i and i think that that's that's for important reasons so i i just um there's so much wisdom coming um coming to me through the chat both on the sources and more more broadly on the issues so i i just wanted to say that that this it's um it can it can be a triggering topic but it's it's just it's a big topic and um, that we all are relating to um we're all relating to in, yeah, in, in for sure. do, do you want to add some specific details uh julia um <laughs> it's just too it's so abundant that it's impossible huh? yeah there, there's there's so much um i mean there's so much. Um, here's my suggestion that yeah. maybe if you if if you want to um, give specific prompts, maybe we actually um, like temporarily open the chat. You can see what people are writing and then close it. Just if you want to um, sort of ask. That'd be great. Yeah, that, 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 that way I can text. quickly peruse yeah. it and maybe comment on one or two. That way, yeah. you know, I, I'll bear the responsibility <laughs> of making choice, and they'll blame me instead of you. But we'll just do it temporarily, and then and then I'm going. In the meantime, I'll I'll keep going through things, and maybe some of the larger questions we can address those at the end. Okay. So yeah. So let me see what people have done, and then. Um, I will. Okay, so we'll so we'll open the chat right now for a few minutes in response to the most um the most recent couple of texts. It's good to be flexible. I like that. All right. So if you want to share, folks, um, just make sure that you're writing to. So they'll have to rewrite them in here. Is, is that the way it works? There weren't responses yet to the to the most recent. Oh, okay. Text, okay. But, um, yeah. Just if you want to respond to the most recent, make sure you put everyone instead of sending it directly to me. I mean, one of the things I, I, I see, um, the first one that came across my screen now is Joe, um, Implications for Dignity of People Suffering from Dementia and Alzheimer's. Um, it is very fair to say, uh, and I'm going to generalize this because so many examples could be used, and I'm sensitive to what we've already seen in the rabbinic sources, that um, the cultural assumptions and prejudices of Jews uh, living in late antiquity in the Eastern Roman Empire were very, very different from our own, from the obvious, um, whether it's okay for a woman to go in public with her um, head or her hair exposed, um, to we saw the discussions of the blind and so forth and the sources we've already seen. Um, I, I think, right, that we've made very good progress um, in appreciating more and more the dignity of people who in past societies and cultures were understood to be of essentially, even inherently, diminished dignity. Uh, I had the experience, actually, uh, with Rabbi Andelman just not literally with you in the class um, a couple of weeks ago, but I, um, I, I taught rabbis at the wonderful um, rabbinic training institute that, um, that your office runs, Julia, and had a wonderful experience. But there was in what I was teaching uh, a comment about the lowliness uh, of uh, someone without sight. Um, and there was in my class uh, one of our rabbis um, who does not have sight. Um, and I had never, you know, been in that setting before where, you know, I caught myself and realized that this text that I've taught many, many times uh, might have a different experience for someone in the class that I'm teaching. You know, I've tried to be sensitive um, to the differences between our attitudes and theirs, but there it was very, very personal um, and so required a different kind of discussion. Uh, I do think that cultures have shamed and those shames have been experienced and they have done harm. All of that is true. Uh, and so far, that's most of what we've seen. It's certainly what we've seen in this text in the Mishnah in Baba Kama, because it is about injury, the injury done through embarrassment or shame. But as we already began to uh, appreciate in the our brief discussion of the Genesis text, shame also has 
uh, a potentially positive value. And we need to capture that too in order to fill out this discussion. And that is where we're gonna go now. I'm gonna give the other side of the um, tradition um, on that. Let me just quickly um, take a quick look at this. Um, yeah, um, um, a friend uh, made comment of the student who hid under the, under the bed of the teacher to learn ideal sexual behavior. Yeah, that's a great example. I actually, with the library, um, which I am the director of, the JTS Library, we had a book talk the hour before this event um, where the authors began the discussion um, by that story. Um, it's true, some things that we would uh, feel shame for or believe cause shame, they didn't, they actually labeled them as Torah. Uh, and that's very, very important. Um, I think, you know, I see now, Julia, the difficulty um, of all of this. I'm just gonna catch one more. Could the story about the woman whose head was bared be extrapolated um, to the right of a sex worker not to be raped? Of course, and much, much more um, than that. Um, what one exposes in the literal and figurative sense uh, of our language, oneself too, does not give others the right to expose or injure you. That is the most crucial um, of these pieces so far. So um, there's a lot to be said. You know, I'm going to go to the other side of this because I'm afraid that if we only stay with this side, um, it will feel as though um, shame has no redemptive place, uh, and there is a part of the tradition that believes it does, and so I think it's more important for us to go on with that and have a complicated discussion, appropriately um, complex, based upon the different sides of this. So uh, let's get rid of the chat, and Tani, if you'll go back and share the sources. Um, we, we did just close the chat, so if you want to ask a question, you should send it directly to me now. And maybe, Professor Kramer, do you want to... Um, should we save the rest of the questions for the end and you can just teach everything else you want to because we are I think that would make sense. Okay. Yeah, Great. yeah. I, unless I contradict myself and, you know, interrupt myself in the middle, in which case it would have been a bad idea, but I don't know yet. Um, so um, let me um, let me uh, put the next source in context. Um, I am quoting only a very small part uh, of this text from the Babylonian Talmud, uh, Nadarim 20a. Uh, if you know this text, and you may know it without realizing that you know it, uh, it is because the larger text uh, is actually about what a man and his wife are permitted to do in their intimate sexual relations. It is the longest and most detailed discussion in the Talmud of what kind of sex uh, a man and wife are permitted to have. Um, it is a text that's therefore not unexpectedly been written on quite a bit. Typically when it's written on or when it's taught, the part that you've got here is skipped because it's a little bit on the side, but it's not really on the side because uh, going back to the creation story, if we recognize that desire is an important part of sexuality and having one's eyes opened, um, you know, we are, amongst other things, seeing beings, right? It always amazed me as a, as a dog owner and lover. I don't actually have a dog now, um, but I love dogs. Um, you know, that for them, relationships are all about smelling, right? It doesn't matter what you look like, Like right? The dog can be large, small, brown, white, black, doesn't make any difference. The smell is what it's all about. Um, human beings are, needless to say, far more oriented towards sight. And so what the creation, the garden story captures there is the crucial place of having one's eyes opened um, and seeing um, leading to desire, um, it's not a, an accident that the famous Samson story, um, you know, which is about a very, very lustful man, Samson, uh, who does all kinds of damage 
on a kind of his lust, uh, in one of the central themes uh, literarily uh, from beginning to end of that story is what he sees or doesn't see. He sees Delilah or he sees the other Philistine woman, you know, and she finds favor in his eyes. Uh, and that leads to all kinds of destructive consequences. Or of course, at the end, we all recall that he has his eyes gouged out um, which is part of the diminishment of his power. Um, so in any case, um, this text in Nadarim, which explicitly uh, now thematizes the question of shame or embarrassment, again, not to commit to a translation, this follows immediately upon the part of this text that um, advises restraint in seeing in intimate relations. Um, it's, um, you know, I mean, the latter part of the text, what comes after this, there's a far more permissive opinion expressed regarding what uh, couples may do in their intimate sexual context. But at this point, immediately before this, what was said is that a man should not um, look at a woman in her private parts. Um, if you will, in order to appreciate this fully, um, for those of you who um, know it, you won't have to look it up. For those of you who don't recall it, you can look it up uh, on your favorite search engine. Um, what you're meant to imagine here is something like uh, the painter Courbet's very famous and notorious painting, Origin of the World. Uh, if you know what I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about. And if you don't, you'll find out quickly. But in any case, that is what we are meant to bear in mind um, as we go ahead to the teaching here on shame. So it teaches that his fear may be upon your faces. Again, the precise context doesn't matter. This is normal rabbinic expansion on scriptural teaching. So why fear upon the faces? Yirato al penechem. This refers to shame, which is also called shame facedness. We'll see that going forward. That you not sin. This teaches that shame leads to fear of sin. From here, the sage has said, it is a good sign in a person that he is one who experiences shame. It's a good thing to experience shame. Others say any person who experiences shame will not quickly sin. And one who does not have the capacity to be shame-faced, to experience shame. And I would say here, even though Maimonides makes a distinction in a text we'll see shortly, um, the rabbis intend no difference here between um, shame and shame-facedness. It's the capacity to feel shame. It's all the same. Um, but look at the way this states it. One who does not have the capacity to feel shame, to be shame-faced, it is known that his forefathers did not stand on Mount Sinai. If you can't experience shame, right, then you can't experience, to come back to an earlier part of the discussion, the guilt of knowing that something you've done is wrong. And without the ability to do that, how can you possibly have been one who stood at Sinai and heard the covenant of law that said, here are a lot of things that you should do, and here are a lot of things that you shouldn't do, and the things that you shouldn't do um, are considered to be sinful, right? So shame arises there uh, in a variety of ways. Let's go on and see the way um, the teachers who followed the Talmud picked up on this. First of all, Maimonides, and I'm going to do it in the order that it appears on your page, even though this is out of chronological order. Um, so um, in the Mishnah Torah, uh, and just to uh, put this in context, um, I, I mean, you'll see both of these are philosophical teachings. Uh, Maimonides, in the very first section of his Mishnah Torah, um, 
constructs a philosophical treatise. Uh, it is the introduction to the Mishnah Torah, uh, but it is like similar legal treatises in the Islamic world that began uh, with broad philosophical observations and advice concerning how to live the best life that wasn't related to the law as such, and then went into the details of the law. Um, but anyhow, that's Maimonides here. And he writes, as you can see, he who follows such conduct and the conduct he's talking about, um, deot, this section of the Mishnah Torah, is about how one should conduct oneself in one's relationships and affairs. And before this, um, he talks about partners um, respecting one another, exercising restraint in their sexual relations. Uh, and he goes into some detail on that. And now he expands. He says, he who follows such conduct will not only sanctify his soul and live in a state of purity and improve his ideas, but if he will father children, um, they will be refined and modest. I draw your attention to the fact that this is um, a fake out, this translation. Im uh, hayu if he has children, yiyu na'im, right? That could be even beautiful, but I think refined there is fine. Uvay shanim. The point is that if someone can experience embarrassment or shame, then their children will acquire the same characteristic. And that is considered to be a good thing. Why? And I think that what follows here is actually, in some measure, a cause and effect. If they are refined and can experience embarrassment or shame, then they will be prepared for wisdom and piety. But he who follows the conduct of the rest of the people, of common people, and Maimonides had a great deal of disdain for common people. He was an elitist through and through, um, who walk in darkness. Such a person will father children in their own likeness. Now, I don't know um, about his child raising psychology, but the important point here is um, that the ability to experience shame is clearly represented as a good thing. And if one experiences this, um, then one will raise children who have the same quality, um, and that will be something that's good to pass on. Um, so I could stop here, but Julia, you encouraged me to go on and get us through the sources. So I'll say, keep that one in mind, and let's see what else we can pick up here. Maimonides in a different formulation, an earlier formulation, and here, um, please don't take the different words used in the translation too literally, because here Maimonides, this is the text I referred to before, is struggling with definition. Um, and he is offering to us his general observation, which he learned from ultimately Aristotle, but which came through Islamic philosophy, that the best way to conduct oneself is the middle way, the golden mean. Um, which he calls the mimutsa. You can see that um, in the Hebrew here. And he says, and bashfulness, or some such translation, the Hebrew boshet panim, is the mean between impudence, that's a good translation, and embarrassedness, that is my retranslation, which I wasn't consistent in retranslating what follows, but that I did retranslation, re retranslate. The term is baishanut, that same term, baishan, all coming back to the same root. But here, Maimonides wants to distinguish between shamefacedness, boshet panim, and embarrassedness, which um, being the opposite extreme from impudence is considered to be um, an extreme. So in the middle is something that is labeled boshet panim, you know, bashfulness of face or something. The extreme, and for Maimonides, extremes are always to be condemned, is on the one hand, what's translated here as impudence, harshness, right? You cause harm to another, you embarrass them, and you refuse to recognize it, right? It is even sometimes translated as cruelty. You cause another harm, and you absolutely refuse to recognize your part. That's an extreme to be condemned. But on the other hand, he admits that it's possible to embarrass too easily. 
So what comes in between? It's this thing called Boshit Panim. So now the explanation, the explanation of these matters gleaned from the sayings of our sages seems to be this. In their opinion, a man who experiences shame is one who is very bashful. So if you embarrass too easily, right, that's not good. Shamefacedness, right, something more to the mean is better. This we gather from their saying, and this is the other side of it. Someone who is, I, I'm now going to retranslate it, very bashful, cannot learn. If you embarrass too easily, you cannot learn. They also assert that one who has shame of face is worthy of paradise. So you've got embarrassing as not a good thing, right? Because you won't learn. Um, and embarrassing being a good thing, because if you have that quality to feel shame or embarrassment, you are promised a place in paradise. Um, the case of the one who embarrasses too easily is the one who will not speak up in a classroom for fear that you will consider their question to be a stupid question, who won't speak up at all for fear that they will be judged. That kind of extreme embarrassment is condemned because you won't make progress. Better you should be able to speak up and ask a question and not worry that you will be judged for the question. That's the one side. At the same time, you can see that there is an in-between quality, which is called here Boshit Panim, um, which one experiences to keep one in the position in the middle. Um, and that position in the middle takes responsibility and is slow to sin because it's afraid of what you might do to others and so forth. That's the quality that's praised. Let's see the way that goes on here. So we've got uh, just a few sources quickly. You'll see these are very much in agreement with one another. Let's go below. First of all, uh, Rosh Bash, Lomo Ibn Aderet, um, Barcelona. We are in Barcelona in the uh, 13th century. I want to be in Barcelona in the 13th century or even in the 21st century. Because now here he's going to say something that is very chauvinistic. I use it not for his chauvinism, um, but for what he says about the capacity to feel shame. Because the nature of Israel is more pleasant, because they are accustomed to do meets vote, and they are natural merciful and capable of shame, right? Israel is naturally capable of experience shame, according to his anthropology. Even their milk raises a nature like them. The mother's milk of a Jewess will raise a child who suckles that milk um, to be like the parent. And this is why it says about Moses that he didn't want to suck, suck the milk of a Gentile woman, as it says in the Midrash, in the Agadah. And that's, of course, why his sister had to take him to his mother when he was an infant in order to be sustained, because, God forbid, he should have sucked from the milk of someone who would not raise him uh, in order to be able to experience the shame that comes comes with certain acts. But now, this is very interesting on Moses. Um, Clea Carr, number seven, uh, next page. Um, so this is uh, a, um, a Polish teacher of, um, as you can see, um, the latter part of the 16th into the early um, 17th century. And he's commenting here on the fact that Moses, uh, when he comes off the mountain from receiving the law, uh, as some of us taught frequently in the early days of the pandemic, has to wear a mask. Um, he has to veil his face. And so the question is, why does he do that? And look at the comment here. It's quite brilliant, actually. He placed the cover over his face because everyone was looking at him. And Moses was very humble and capable of shame, right? He was embarrassed that everyone, right? I imagine the 600,000, you know, and that's only the adult men, you know, in this vast population seeing um, the shining of his face. So he was capable of being embarrassed. And he was embarrassed when the people looked at the radiance of his face, for this is the quality of one who shames. And he therefore put a veil on his face to cover the eyes, right? So they did not be seen in all of his beauty, right? Moses did not want to be seen. He was embarrassed to be seen in all of his beauty. But whenever he came before God to re receive instruction from God, he was, I don't know what the here there is. Um, he was required to remove the veil of shame from his face 
in keeping with the sage's principle that one who is prone to shame cannot learn. So Moses, like any other student, needs to be able to learn without inhibition. So when he comes to God to learn, where God is the teacher, he's got to forget his possible embarrassment and expose himself. A student to learn has to expose themselves. Um, and so in a very, very different way than uh, Maimonides did, the Clea Carr resolves the tension um, between the rabbinic teachings by saying, on the one hand, it is a good thing to experience, to be able to experience shame or embarrassment um, because that causes restraint and so forth. Um, it causes one to be modest and not cruel, as we've already seen and we'll see it once again um, in the following teaching. Um, but at the same time, there are times um, that that quality should be suppressed. Last but not least, um, so this I uh, drew um, draw to your attention. It is, as you can see, quite a bit later. Um, the teaching is from um, a Hungarian um, town by the name of Siget. Some of you will recognize that uh, as it was the town that Eli Wiesel came from. Um, it was also the town where my teacher and PhD advisor, um, David Halivni, um, came from. The, 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 he and Wiesel grew up together. Um, and um, this individual, the Yismach Moshe, is a title bound uh, founder of Satmar Hasidim, for those of you who know that tradition. So in any case, he says the intent is to say that there are in this nation those who experience shame and those with mercy and those who perform deeds of loving kindness. And notice the way those are put together. There are many before him who put these three together. I just chose this because of its setting, right? But to be a Baishan, to be a Rahman, Rahman, to have loving kindness or mercy, um, to be a gomel chasadim. These are all clearly, and the combination here suggests powerfully, these are all very, very good qualities. And this is because Israel cleaves more closely to God um, than any other creatures and dwells among them. As it says, I shall dwell in the midst of the children of Israel. They therefore have greater influence than other creatures from, not upon, not to, but from his qualities. May he be blessed. And to experience shame, this is the root of modesty, since harshness, cruelty, hard facedness is the opposite of experiencing shame. Um, what he suggests here, what he adds to what we saw before, is that actually the ability to experience shame um, has, two, um, has two capacities. Number one, it leads us to modesty, because we know the things that we have done wrong, that we are embarrassed about, even if we don't tell others about it, and we all bear those things. That's crucial. We have all done things that in our private heart of hearts embarrass us, um, but that causes us to recognize our limits uh, and recognition of those limits is a very, very important thing. Um, beyond that though, uh, he represents it as a divine quality um, that um, it is God's influence that helps us to experience that. Uh, and it leads to the opposite of cruelty. It leads to mercifulness, it leads to openness because we know in that secret that causes us shame, that we hope will keep us away from sin in the future, that we have done wrong, that we do things that we are ashamed of. I, you, right? I've done things that I'm ashamed of. I'm not gonna tell you about them, right? But I know them myself. Um, and if I bear them in mind, my hope is that they will um, help me to learn not to cause others um, in the future the kind of injury uh, that I may have caused them in the past. Now, there's a lot more to say here, but we've got about 10 minutes and I want to open up for comments and questions. So, Julia, you are now the moderator. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um... So uh, a lot of people responded to the question early on about shame versus guilt, and um, and there was a um, a view that many people shared, um, and some people referred to teachings of um, of Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, Zichron uh, Vracha. Um, people were distinguishing talking about shame as something as being about who you are, and guilt as being about something that you did. Um, which I thought was was helpful, and apparently um, Jonathan Sachs 
um, writes about that as well. And he also talks about cultures and religions of shame versus guilt. He talks about in a good way as Judaism being a culture of guilt, which maybe we don't think of Jewish guilt as a good thing, but he's differentiating it from cultures of shame that, um, um, I mean, and then, and he names he names certain cultures, but um, right one is about one is about um, yeah. I mean, yeah, I yeah, I hear, I, I, I hear it. Who you are versus versus what you did, which I think that the latter is is um, it creates possibility of repair in a very different way. Yeah, um, I know of that teaching. I actually didn't know that before I started researching to put sources together here, um, and ran across it in a number of settings. Um, the quotation of Sachs. I don't agree. I don't think that distinction applies. If others like the distinction, please. But um, with respect to Jewish tradition, I just don't objectively, I don't agree. You can see um, the use of the term here, both for good and for bad. Um, and um, when it says, you know, by Sean and says that the ability to experience this, to have this feeling is actually a good thing, it's corrective, I think it means shame. So it is, as far as I'm concerned, unambiguously a part of Jewish culture as well. Okay, good. Healthy uh, debate here. Um, um, a few people talked, I wanted to share kind of two, two different comments about the, uh, the duration of shame, how long shame lasts. So um, a few people who were um, survivors of, um, of rape and molestation and domestic violence um, shared comments um, and talked about the, you know, the long lasting nature of that shame. Um, and one person even talked about not not just not just her own experience of shame, but um, decades after having been molested as a child, someone else found out about about this and blamed blamed her, the, the child victim. So it's not only lifelong shame or long term shame that can come from inside, but from others as well. Um, and then a you know kind of a very different comment about the duration of shame is the question of cancel culture, which I know is super loaded, um, but right we do have. Um, we have, there are people who are canceled who um, may, may deserve it and other people who, you know, kind of make a mistake and, and, and there's these massive long-term consequences um, that maybe weren't deserved. So there, those were two comments about the duration of shame, if you want to comment on either of them. Yeah, I, I, uh, <laughs> in some measure, I've got to say, um, I'll leave it to the psychologists to, um, you know, to really address this in a way far better than I could. Um, it was interesting to me your first comment from the woman who spoke about, you know, the feeling of shame. This is the duration of shame decades after having been molested. I think I heard you use the word guilt in your comment. You know, made to feel guilty. Right, being blamed for you, right, and blame and guilt go together. This is, I'll just come back to that in order to uh, re emphasize that guilt and shame uh, and, you know, go together wherever there's blame, experience of guilt, experience of shame. Um, it's hard to, um, you know, make clean categories around these things. Uh, all I will say is, hey, listen, we are all limited on some level to ourselves. Right? We can participate in the experience of others. And one of the reasons that um, I love memoirs and love fiction even more than memoirs uh, is because those are the places where I can most completely, if still imperfectly, experience what another experiences. Right. If it's done well, it can bring me into their emotion, into their experience so that I come close to identifying with them. And the reason I point to that is because, you know, I, I can't know how another experiences shame um, and um, how debilitating it is or isn't at different stages. I, I, I mean, it would be cruel chutzpah of me to do anything more than that. Um, but what I can say is that there are things that I've done, like there are things that we've all done, um, that are the source of embarrassment or shame. Um, and they may, on the one hand, still hurt much later, 
right? I, I, I don't mean to deny that. But at the same time as they hurt, um, they hurt less when I've used them um, in ways that I think have helped improve me. Um, again, I recognize that I'm only responding personally. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm sorry if this is insensitive to somebody else's experience, but it's the only experience that I have. Well, thank you for that. And I'm, I'm, I mean, someone just, just commented directly related to that about how, um, right, some of us are more skilled than others in managing shame and sort of using it, um, sort of deploying it for self-improvement um, or letting it go as needed versus really internalizing it. Absolutely. Uh, Very important. Um, all right. So maybe I, the, one, the one thing before you go on, though, the one thing that sh should be clear from all these sources is the outlying extreme that Jewish tradition rejects is what's called azut, or also azut panim. I mean, the term, right? And that means harshness, cruelty, the inability to break and feel when one has potentially done harm to others. Um, and so, you know, there needs to be some asset that seeps through that. I'm using a metaphor here quite consciously because you know that hardness is like a metallic hardness. What seeps through it? Um, and you know, if we're going to stand a chance of being improved at all, we need something to seep through it. Thanks for sharing that. There were there were many comments also, which uh, about um, you know about intention about and and about even if you didn't intend to cause someone shame you know, having the capacity to realize when, when you did um, and, 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 and empathy. So you, you, re, you just responded to several, several comments that people raised. So maybe, maybe just one more, um, and this is maybe more directly related to the text. So um, the, someone raised the idea that there's, there's a contradiction between on the one hand, the, um, you know, the text about about the con about kind of the contextual nature of, of of shame and sort of the degree of shame that one experiences based on context, who you are, where it is, what you're doing, versus um, you know the rabbis also are sort of creating they create certain rules from life as they see it about what's shameful, um, and that especially applies to women and what they wear and what's exposed. So there's kind of a tension there about um, about something objective and maybe arbitrary and maybe things we wouldn't agree with now um, versus an, an idea of shame that really allows for, for, um, for contextual variation. Yeah, I don't see them as quite as in conflict as the questioner may have. Um, uh, you know, to, to begin with, shame applies to, you know, exposed men and women. There's actually a very important teaching in the Talmud, which asks the question simultaneously, if, an, if a poor person comes up to you asking for a donation, either for clothing or for food, right? Are you allowed to examine them? Are you allowed to check that they really need it? Maybe they're, you know, just putting you on. Maybe they're, you know, like you hear the frequent, oh, they, you know, they're all the time. They're just, you know, involved in a hustle. Um, and what's, what's interesting and important about the text is that while there are different opinions expressed, um, the Talmud recognizes that since hunger leads to physical pain, you can't examine on it, you have to give. And the other opinion says, since exposure leads to embarrassment, to shame, you can't examine under those, you know, under that um, situation. And th that is both for males and for females. Yes, of course, they do understand women to be more susceptible through exposure to shame. Um, do they consider that to be culturally historical contingent or not? I think the rabbis were probably a bit too limited to recognize how contextual um, contingent it is. Um, but you know, there are a lot of other things they got right. I, I heartily agree. Um, thank you so much. I, I think the reason we keep asking you to kick off the series is that you, you, you know, just um, plunge us into the deep end right away. So, um, so this is such a rich session um, that clearly people responded to so much. Um, and 
you know, really a lot going on in that in those texts that um, that make us think about shame in different ways. So thank you so much for teaching us today. Um, and thanks to everyone for joining. Thank you again to Marlene Castle for your sponsorship. And I want to um, invite people to um, come back next week. Our session next week will be with uh, Professor Benjamin Sommer who will be teaching on the book of Psalms and he'll be talking about emotion and reason um, and you know when those are in conflict and, and specifically the book of Psalms sort of is, is it trying to appeal to our emotions and do we want to um, privilege that or um, looking at things from an intellectual standpoint. Um, so presumably we've all experienced uh, that tension as well and hopefully you'll join us next week to, um, to learn about that and the sources. So thank you um, again for joining us. Thank you again to Professor Kramer and hope everyone has a wonderful week. See you again soon.